timely fashion. I want to invite you to um, take the two mics, uh, one on either side of the room. Just uh, line up there and I'll, I'll alternate and recognize you. A number of you have come to me with questions, so I know that there are questions uh, to be shared in here. Uh, so if you can just take to either one of the two mics, uh, identify yourself, please. If, you, if it's someone specific you're asking the question to, that's fine. If it isn't, uh, we'll figure out who uh, answers it. I'm gonna start right over there, sir. Should be, try, try talking and it might be working. Where is it? Yes. Yep. Uh, New engineer is always trying to fix something. Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, Shmuel Oren, University of California at Berkeley. Uh, one is uh, with about uh, automated vehicles, elect, um, cars. Can we ever automate the ethical decision? Do you kill the mm. passenger or do you kill the guy in the sidewalk when push comes to shove on that, when you have to make a split second decision like that? Yes, it depends on who owns the car. Uh, but actually, this came up in our uh, earlier discussions. H how does one, uh, in any form of automation, I think this might be uh, in any form of autonomy, I think we should, we should bring this up, how do those kinds of decisions get made, and do they get made better than the human brain makes them? So this has been a hot topic of discussion in the community for the past couple of years or so. So this goes back to what is known as the uh, uh, trolley problem in uh, psychology dating back decades, if you will. Uh, imagine that you are the operator of a trolley in the middle of a city, and then the uh, track forks, and you as the operator basically have the control to basically go straight or basically take that uh, turn, and you see that there's basically a, a person on the track you're driving in, in which case the decision is obvious, you basically make a turn and then basically not kill the person. But now basically, of course, you can make it incrementally more complex. That is a second person on the other on the, on the track, what do you do, right? You, do you kill this person or that person? And then basically you say, I guess, uh, uh, one outcome, I think there's something like the following. You have to uh, operate the lever to basically turn the other side, kill the other person. And the easy answer is basically, I won't do anything at all. One person dies. If I take an action, another person dies, but I did not take any action to kill the other person. Right? But now basically, now basically you can uh, play all these uh, mind games in the situation. The person uh, that you would kill is a child, and the other side is an old person. right? Right. So the logical answer would be uh, the child has many more years in front of uh, the child, and therefore you should be killing the other person, and you take proactive action to basically kill the other person. Right? Yeah. And now basically say, what if there are basically three old people and, and one child, which is more <laughs> valuable, right? And then so, so, so now basically, so now basically let's follow. Let's Access their medical records really quickly. Yes, yeah. Right? For, <laughs> yeah, for example, the child could be suffering from terminal cancer, could die next month, <laughs> right? So who should you kill now? Right? And now basically now map it on, onto the road. Basically there's now imagine that uh, I'm an old person uh, in the quote unquote uh, in the car and there's a child uh, up front. Right? I could basically make that decide, hey, uh, do I kill the child or do I kill myself by running into this electric pole on, on the right? right? And a rational person could say that I should kill myself because I've li lived a good life, let the child live. Right? Now basically take the same scenario and basically say that child out there, I guess that the vehicle is driving itself now, making the same decision, right? But the child in front is basically your grandchild, right? Pretty much every person, a rational person would basically say, save my grandchild. So what's the answer? <laughs> right? And meanwhile, basically now take it all the way to uh, people who actually make these cars, making these uh, decisions. If I basically market the car that I'm making, saying that, hey, uh, this car will kill somebody else, Oh, sorry, it actually will actually save somebody else and kill you. Would you want to go buy the car? <laughs> right? Car makers cannot basically brand their vehicles actually being uh, capable of uh, doing that. It just, just doesn't work. Right? <laughs> so it turns out that, ask yourself the following question. How many people in this room today uh, actually have ever in their life basically made the decision, I'm going to kill this person as opposed to that person? These are very rare edge corner cases. So it's I easy, really, I guess in my heart, I do believe that these rare edge cases should not <laughs> decide how the technology evolves. We do not want a programmer drinking Coke and eating pizza making those decisions. <laughs> well said. That was a very thorough answer. Uh, that's, I appreciate that. All right, okay. uh, I got a lot of questions, so I want to get through, I need to get through everybody's questions. I'm going to go over here, please. Uh, Peter Bethel with uh, Marshall Miller and Associates. I travel extensively 
internationally and domestically in my line of business. And I spend interminable hours in airports which are grungy and overcrowded due to air traffic control delays. And I find it, personally, I find it unacceptable and depressing that I have to live with old technology because the new technology is safe. I would think in this environment where we are making technological leaps every day that you shouldn't be doomed to sit in grungy airports because we have to use old systems. I also understand that other countries throughout the world use uh, more advanced, more efficient, sophisticated air traffic control systems, which I, I would imagine are safe. Otherwise, are you telling me that I should not fly to Frankfurt or Singapore or Hong Kong because I'm likely to be crash another plane's likely to crash into me on the ground? So my question is, I really think the answer that we should stick with the current status because new technology is unsafe is personally is an unacceptable answer for an institution like this. Okay, there's an example of not a question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but Claire, why don't you give it a shot? <laughs> Question, the question is, should we apply somebody else's technology okay, that's better yeah, than ours? Was, thank you for helping with that. Let's, uh, let's see. <laughs> we, uh, the, uh, um, the FAA is doing that. Um, it's the technology is continually being upgraded, and um, there are new algorithms and new methodologies that are being vetted and tested and um, incorporated into the air traffic control system. And, um, you know, the Oakland Center of, um, you know, 25 years ago is very different from the Oakland Center of today, for example, in terms of the technologies that they're using. Um, I think that um, there, there needs to be a process which is, um, well, we, we talked about this before, that, that needs to be continually upgrading and continually um, assessing what new technologies can be applied to improve the efficiency of the system while still maintaining and perhaps improving the level of safety that we have. So I'm, I'm a proponent of technology. It's why, why I'm in the area, and that's what I've been working on for my career. I just um, don't believe that we should leapfrog and introduce autonomy in areas when we don't really understand its implications. Over there. Kishore Mehta from Texas Tech University. And it'll be a question. It, uh, we talk about the technical aspects of it, but the socioeconomic impact to me, it seems like it's going to be huge when we go to autonomous in all cases. I would like your comments on that. Mm. I guess it's most huge in cars, right? We have more drivers than we have any of these other categories. So there are clearly uh, social aspects. Uh, at least uh, the beginning, uh, these vehicles will be a lot costlier, right? So the question is who can afford to do, do this? Uh, it also turns out that the, the richer ones who can afford these cars are the ones who will be more sensitive about the technology, about the safety implications, and so on. So over time, these things, I think, will uh, play out and balance each other out. And uh, when uh, these uh, so-called automation features incrementally get into your uh, sweet spot of the market, uh, family sedans, and so on, uh, mass uh, volumes uh, kick in, and the prices, prices will drop, and the technology will become uh, democratized. So the, uh, the bigger question, however, is basically uh, if uh, vehicles can become driverless at some point in the future, what happens to the millions of uh, jobs that uh, truckers, bus drivers, taxi drivers, and the others have, and so on? It turns out uh, trucking is actually a huge, uh, a big portion of the uh, US economy and such. So, so what does it mean to jobs? Uh, so, so to me, there is uh, good news and bad news, if you will. The bad news is that at some point in time, uh, vehicles will become driverless, right? So no matter what the timeline is, at some point in time, that will happen. And uh, so therefore, jobs will be lost. The good news is that, at least from my point of view, it's going to take uh, many, many years before the drivers will be taken out of the driving equation. So therefore, we have the luxury of the time to basically plan ahead, uh, think ahead. Uh, so it's basically useful to cite a couple of uh, statistics. Go back to the uh, turn of the uh, 19th century, uh, even maybe even the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, a significant fraction of the US population used to work in uh, fields in agriculture, and then the 20th century, I guess, work in uh, factories and such, right? Uh, most of those jobs have gone away. Today, the official unemployment rate is about 4.25% in the country, right? 
So basically huge segments of the economy of jobs have disappeared, but uh, we are basically pretty much an all-time low on, on, on unemployment. So I think these concerns are valid, but I think equally good answers will exist. We may not know all the answers. For example, these uh, uh, drivers whose jobs will be lost could be actually be earning even higher salaries, working on basically uh, sensors, basically have to uh, uh, equip uh, these vehicles, basically have higher paying jobs to basically diagnose and fix the equipment and such. So the, so tra the transition is important here. Uh, we don't want to end up with a situation like we've got with coal miners where there's an expectation that the jobs continue while technology takes the jobs away on an ongoing basis. Social and economic implications, any comments on those in, in your fields? Well, I think for, um, you know, I didn't mention this, but introducing UAVs into the airspace, it's not just big business. It's um, I mean, in hurricanes, for example, or disaster relief, search and rescue, just, just gathering more information. It, there's, there's, there's wonderful opportunities for these mobile sensors to be used and, and to basically do it in a way that's safe for the people who are, who are trying to gather this information. So, so there's a lot of um, reasons and socioeconomic reasons why you'd want to, um, why, why you'd want to push um, movement and, and progress in terms of allowing more autonomy and more functionality in these systems. Yeah, I, I would just say that in the ocean environment, it's a, it, it's a market creation problem in our case. So you're not replacing a capability that's already out there. You're providing a completely new capability that actually, actually enables new industries. So what you're seeing are the emergence of these new industries in the ocean environment, and, their, and in effect, their rate of progress is kind of what moderates uh, the rate of progress in the marine robotics domain. So I, I do think, though, that we're sort of living in the dawn of sort of a new ocean century where you're going to see uh, more and more of your food uh, coming from the sea, uh, more and more of your energy coming from the sea. And that's uh, not just, I'm not talking about oil and just oil and gas. Winds mm -hmm. are roughly twice as high over ocean as they are over land. Power goes as velocity cubed. That's a big multiplier. Uh, and these, uh, these are sophisticated infrastructure that you're putting out there, which are going to need on, ongoing maintenance. So, so I think that there's a whole set of activities that we're going to move gradually out of the terrestrial environment and into the ocean environment, and robotics will be what allows it to happen. In the early stages, it'll be a job gain. You know, I think I think there'll be a lot of jobs. In, and I would think the, the same thing in space, right? You're, you're looking at net gains if, as your research goes on. Right, so in space, uh, the first level has started in terms of the telecommunications, right? The cellular phone, the communication, the global communication that's using space. You see now new companies starting in imaging, you know, from space. So at least near Earth application, you see the, uh, the society starting to use <coughs> space uh, as a socioeconomic platform. Uh, again, uh, I tend to be on the more abstract uh, intellectual space exploration for science reason. And so just tying into your uh, question is my dream would be that space does become actively used, just like telecommunications and images, but other applications, maybe uh, re mining in space or you know, having uh, stations on the moon and uh, manufacturing new materials that are not possible to manufacture without gravity, right, down on Earth. If that industry takes off, my hope is that space community, spacecraft just become affordable. We find ways to launch spacecraft affordably, ways to get sensors, materials to build spacecraft uh, affordably, and we extend all the way out to you know, science application. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schwartz, Columbia University. The question of flying cars has always intrigued me. It particularly comes to root when I'm stuck in traffic. Now, if I had a flying car and I wanted to lift up at that point, so would everybody else. So the key question then is, there'll be many, many more flying cars than there are airplanes. Now, they might be asked to only do this at a certain location, but how do you, how do you control thousands and thousands and thousands of flying cars? Yeah, I think that's the question. Which may be why you started with air traffic control. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I, I think, you know, these flying car companies, um, I know a couple of them, the, 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 the big work that's happened to date has been, you know, designing these vehicles, and they're be some of them are just amazing, these vehicles, and the kinds of things they've done, I mean, what, the motors, the batteries. Um, they, the, the, the sort of airspace integration functionality, the kind of thing, what do you do if there's a thousand flying cars around? Really, the only um, kind, I, I think the focus so far has been on detect and avoid, which is obviously very important. 
but, but there's a lot of other airspace functionality that, you know, that, that air traffic control provides as a service to people who fly that, um, that needs to be understood. How do, you, how do you do this? How do you take, how do you schedule things? How do you make it so that it, it all works together as well as, you know, bigger jets? And how do you avoid those little UAVs that are flying around? So I, I think that these are the big questions that have yet to be answered for flying cars. But, but fundamentally, it, the, the regulatory framework that is to evolve has not acted as, a, as an impediment to the design and engineering, am I right? I, I don't believe so. I think that, um, and I do believe that some of the companies who are building flying cars have been working with, say, a person from the FAA to understand the regulations. What would have to happen? Can you just take off from the road, or does it have to be at a, a right. given place? Right, so I think that, um, I think that they're just not at the point where it's become so much in the discussion yet right. in terms of the regulations. These are fantastic questions, though. Everybody's bringing new things to, to light. Go ahead. Yeah, this is Richard Korsmeyer from the bioengineering section. I'd like to pose a question to the panel about a, a fifth environment, and that's the, the human body. What do you see as the possibility for miniaturized technologies that could provide autonomous systems, that could provide operations inside the human body? Mm. And maybe the ocean's a good place to start with that. Wow. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, so, uh, I will say, so I will say that one of my side gigs, uh, millennials, uh, the millennials all have side gigs, so I guess we, we need to now too, is uh, uh, on the editorial board of Science Robotics. And so I will say that the largest, the, one of the largest uh, uh, sort of robotics literatures is a actually the, the medical robotics literature. And so, so I think you're right, you know, to, to call out that, that, that that's a bit of a missing piece. Uh, here on, on the stage today. So uh, my wife is a veterinarian. Uh, you know, I think, that, I think, of, I think of it as, as to first order where you would apply, uh, this is to the diagnostics part of it, to the big data part of it. And I, and I, you know, folks in the audience here probably have a better understanding of this maybe than those of us on the stage. But what I see are in cases like, uh, 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 you know, coming up with treating, treatment regimens for uh, cardiac patients, uh, that you're seeing enormous increases in survival uh, at the two-year mark, you know, 80, 80, 90 percent improvement in survival, which comes from just simply using the tools we have better um, through allowing ourselves to incorporate more data. Part of it has to do with digitization, right, of, of the medical, medical records. In terms of actually, you know, small robots, um, you know, there are uh, a lot, there is a lot of interesting work on very, very small uh, systems for, for even steering them remotely uh, through flesh, through, uh, you know, through blood vessels. Uh, you know, those all seem a, a pretty long way out, out, out for me, and I'll be the first to acknowledge that my medical background is, is lacking for, to answer that one. <laughs> a good try, thank you. Hi. Thank you very much for the beautiful presentations. My name is Jose Mora, and I'm with Carnegie Mellon University. So my question, I actually have two questions. One is for Raj, uh, and it's very pragmatic. What do you actually see as the most probable? Is it going to be urban traffic, driverless cars? Is it going to be highway traffic, big trucks? So is it Uber replacing uh, its uh, drivers? or is it the big tracks like Waymo? And the second question is for Jim. You kind of looked at the, the deep ocean, but the, I see it much more likely the surface autonomy, so tugs, uh, uh, harbor tugs, uh, ferries, uh, the container vessels, the oil tankers. Can you comment on that? Thank you. Great, thank you, great questions. Uh, with respect to uh the segments where autonomy will come in first, uh, let's look at the bigger picture. Uh, market studies indicate that maybe about 15, 20 years from now, the vehicle automation market uh, will be about 1.5 to $2 trillion every year with a, with a T, right? So these are basically huge markets. We basically break it up, like that is the uh, uh, defense segment. There's kind of the uh, private uh, uh, shipyard, dockyard market, then basically the passenger vehicle markets. 
uh, about 100 million vehicles get sold every year in the automotive segment. The trucking industry is actually a huge, truck, uh, huge part of the transportation industry as well. So we, we can pretty much try to automate each one of these things. As it turns out, uh, we live in a very capitalistic society, activity happening on all these fronts. I guess the ones that we see in the media primarily are the ones about uh, Waymo, uh, Google, uh, uh, GM uh, buying, uh, uh, buying crews, and then Ford investing in Argo.ai and so on. Uh, so uh, progress is being made on all fronts on the trucking industry. The, the trucking industry is actually uh, ripe, if you will, in a couple of aspects. Uh, most of the uh, long-haul trucking is about driving uh, mindlessly, if you will, on highways for hours at a time, days at a time, and so on. So it's basically a very rational candidate, a logical candidate for automation. Uh, so there are companies like, I guess, uh, Auto, OTTO, I guess, got bought out by Uber, a drama is playing out there. So it uh, turns out that, so that is actually, a, from a technical standpoint, the technology is almost there. It's only a question of uh, cost, if you will, uh, training and regulations. Uh, as these things go, just like the FAA, the transportation regulatory framework does not uh, progress very rapidly. So we are still many years from deployment from uh, a practical standpoint. If you basically take that 100 million cars being sold every year, most of them uh, will be driving in urban cortex and so on. From an Uber perspective, if they can basically remove the driver from the driver's seat, they get to basically keep uh, an additional 70, 75 cents of every dollar that comes in. These are huge financial incentives, if you will. Uh, so uh, both sides' progress are uh, being made. The urban problem from a technical standpoint is actually a lot more complex, a lot uh, harder. That being said, on the highway context, uh, the speeds are much higher. So something goes wrong, the error margins are that much uh, thinner. And then when a, a family with a bunch of kids basically dies, uh, media, of course, is going to be all over it. And we do not quite know what the uh, uh, social uh, uh, pushback will be. So some of these things are yet to be played out, but progress is being made on all fronts. Uh, so I guess my bet says that uh, uh, drive, fully driverless operations many, many years away. By that point in time, both may be in the roughly same time frame. Very good answer. Thank you. So yes. I'll, uh, I'll try to be brief here, but I think, you know, basically very good, very good question. Uh, you can kind of think of if you, uh, the classic disruptive, uh, you know, innovation model is you enter with a niche market, you know, where you can do something no one else can do. And the undersea environment was one of those places. Lots of things you can't do in the undersea environment which are valuable. And so it's, a, it's actually a very sensible place to start with robotics. But surface vehicles are definitely uh, fast growing and arguably the fastest growing part of marine robotics uh, right now. And there's been some fantastic innovation in that space, all the way from very small vehicles that do things like scavenge energy from the wave field and use that to propel themselves very long distances. Uh, so liquid robotics, uh, uh, Autonaut, uh, other vehicles uh, use sail uh, to actually uh, go faster, although they have, they, they have a, a tougher time uh, uh, towing things, uh, and then all the way up to uh, cargo vessels. So the Norwegians are working pretty hard on, on autonomous cargo vessels. So, so you're absolutely right. There's a whole set of you know, rules of the road issues uh, in the marine environment that uh, uh, you know, the colleague to the right and left of me uh, have already been dealing with. So I, I won't go into those, but great question. Very good, thank you. Sure. Yeah, my, my name is uh, Dan Baker from the University of Colorado in Boulder. I study the sun and what's broadly called space weather, and this can disrupt uh, GPS, it can uh, degrade um, radio communication, can um, blind sensors and so on. So I guess my question is how seamlessly can that change of, of uh, sensors and their um, responsivity be built into autonomous systems and, uh, and help protect uh, the systems from, uh, from that kind of disruption? Just to understand, this is the c robustness of the communication system? Yeah, a robotic uh, um, having to do with the communication system, but also, the, you know, for airlines that use these oh. sensors and for cars that will use these sensors and so on. So I think it affects in one way all of you and all the systems you're talking about. One of the, um, in, in aircraft, um, the redundancy of, of, of different... Um, different sensor suites, but also different copies of the same sensor suite is, um, is there precisely to um, manage for um, 
effects of, of um, sensor loss or um, um, misinformation. I think that um, there needs to be work in, um, Raj mentioned this term earlier, the, you know, as you integrate sensors into a, a physical system where you know something about this, 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 the dynamics of that system, so this cyber physical system, you can, um, you can actually use those dynamics to help you um, in your um, understand whether your sensors are um, you know, giving you the right information. And so really thinking, and, and so for both security as well as, um, as, well as sensor outages where you know, you're just seeing that your, your system, you know, one of the systems is, um, is not giving you the, the correct information, that, th that could be, there, there could be a lot more autonomous and algorithmic functionality there to be able to protect against um, the kinds of outages that, I'm, I'm not sure about the sort of solar effects that you're talking about, but, but it's a, an area where I feel there, there's a lot that can be done in terms of um, not only using physical redundancy, but using algorithmic redundancy. But you need to know that, the, that your sensors are in error. So you need, to, you need to know that the system is degrading. Something is detect, something is running and continually testing whether, or continually asking whether or not the sensors are providing information that makes sense given what you would expect from both the algorithm as well as the other sensor readings. Yeah, if I can add to that, you highlight uh, GPS and communications. Uh, uh, for uh, autonomous vehicles with uh, GPS, particularly high accuracy GPS with uh, uh, corrections like a differential GPS or real-time uh, kinematics RTK, you can precisely know where you are on the planet and therefore you can basically act appropriately wherever you are, having a, a, da a map database and such. So it's very useful. Uh, conversely, there are lots of GPS denied environments uh, under bridges, uh, inside uh, tunnels, uh, in urban canyons and such, where you cannot depend on a GPS. So if you actually have to operate in certain regions without GPS, why depend on GPS at all? So that's a very valid question that uh, comes about. As uh, this is a very informed community, there's also the possibility that GPS can be spoofed as well. Right? Right. So basically there are companies which basically are looking at, hey, uh, I'm not going to count on GPS at all, in which case you have to count on kind of identifying the landmarks around you and therefore knowing where you are and so on. But there are many environments that are really no unique landmarks uh, on a wide open bridge and so on. So there are pros and cons to pretty much every approach you can take. And my own philosophy is that you need to fuse together as many things as you can and basically try to uh, uh, fuse them together. Right? And basically therefore you get the best of all possible uh, worlds if you will. With respect to wireless communications, I mentioned earlier that uh, smart infrastructure, which tells you what's happening in the environment can help you significantly but that wireless communications can be jammed as well, in which case you need to have local intelligence. So the answer is that, so I guess this generation in particular, we used to navigate, find our ways to a destination without using a GPS device, right? <laughs> so in principle, you can operate without GPS, but it's going to take time there, so give us some time. Okay. <laughs> Do you remember those days? I will, I will say in the underwater environment, we operate without GPS all the time. We have no choice. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Megan Smith. I was the United States Chief Technology Officer with President Obama, third one, and uh, I have a new company called Shift7. Uh, so this panel is wonderful. And uh, I think that a lot of times when people think about robotics and, and automation, they kind of have this Hollywood view of transformers and, and scary things. And so it's so delightful to see what looks like a beautiful sea turtle robot, right? Or a flying helicopter. And uh, you know, just to circle back to the beginning of the meeting with Dan uh, and this idea of grand challenges and the young people uh, in our world, I, I think there's great opportunity to really do what our medal winner did, really scrub them in earlier in participating, not so much filling their minds with content so later they can do capstone at the end of school, but how about freshman year, how about kindergarten, uh, and participate with us. Um, one of the great challenges we have, we led the AI conversation for President Obama and we did many town hall meetings around safety and control at, at, at CMU and out at UW um, around law and policy, other things. And one of the things that was very striking is the lack of creative participation by most of humanity. There's a small number of people in a handful of countries designing AI for seven billion plus people. And so, that's a real challenge because we bring our biases. I was just at MIT for board meetings and uh, one of the young researchers in the media lab 
She happens to be African American, and so she carries a white face, and she puts it on her face when she's trying to get face recognition to work for her. And so they created a, a test out of Media Lab to help all of our researchers using parliaments. So the parliament of Iceland is a 95 plus percent recognizable community. The parliament of Rwanda is in the 30 percent. So we really have to make sure that in our car algorithm, should we, who should we kill, that we don't accidentally kill whole swaths of people of color because we didn't bother to include their existence in our algorithms. And we didn't include their existence because they weren't in the design team, because we discriminated so heavily for hundreds of years. And none of us in this room created all of the bias that exists, but we certainly inherit it. And so we have to work on it. The way that I, so my question is. She knew my I was question get is, there. <laughs> I don't tend to, work on what's the problem. I try to look for what's already promising, very much like venture capital. They don't make the companies, they just help them. And I'll tell you two things I've seen that are really promising. My ask for you is what is the most promising, inclusive things each of you have seen? So for example, I've been across the country this summer on the tech jobs tour. In Appalachia, I met the 12 coal miners who are coding coal to code. 800 people tried for those jobs. They founded a company to start learning code and now they're reshoring jobs for coding. Fabulous new company. It's happening all over the country. So people are retraining themselves. So have you seen things like that? The Oklahoma Muscogee Creek tribe is teaching, yeah, awesome, is teaching coding. In, yeah, we, need a, we need a question. Yeah, yeah. So the Oklahoma teams are teaching coding in, in Head Start. In Head Start. I really got to have a question. Yeah, the next thing start. has to be a question with a mark. So what's the most exciting thing, like, teaching kindergartners, pre-Kers, coding and robotics. Okay, well, thank you for that. And doing? thank you thank for you. pointing out that it really is a wonderful panel. Uh, I, I, I don't <laughs> want you to, uh, the, you know, nothing ever here is common and commonplace. And we really are having a fantastic conversation about a really important stuff. But Mimi and I were talking about what you just mentioned a little earlier. When I said, I'd, I'd made a flippant comment earlier to say, well, look, uh, with oceans, we have an issue. But with space, we've already captured the imag imagination. And Mimi said, I'm not, she wasn't sure that, that she fully agreed with the idea that we've captured the imagination enough. So what is exciting to you, and how do we, how do we make it more so? So uh, yeah, to me, personally, it's exciting because I think it's a more abstract curiosity, right? Really, I mean, where did we come from as a human race, and are we alone? And what is the structure of the solar system and the universe in general? And answering the basic physics uh, questions so that we understand ourselves better. But uh, related to that question, I do fear that that kind of curiosity um, maybe, is it running out? Are we running out of it? Are we becoming so very technical? I think a lot of the questions here are, they are improvement of life, but it's improvement of life now. Immediately, we're driving cars, we're flying, all of that. So uh, it's, it's a question that I raise, uh, I would like to raise, especially in a place like NAE, where you are the intellectual core uh, of the nation. You know, is it getting weaker? Uh, and if I can squeeze in another question, again, because I guess I've been 27 years we're doing NASA work, and it hasn't been in a profit, you know, kind of world, or it's more of <laughs> really answering those kinds of questions, right, very high level questions. Um, as we become more advanced autonomy and all that, are our children uh, starting out in the right way in, with those questions in mind, you know, thinking about the humanity and the fundamental, uh, improving the fundamental knowledge uh, in physics and the science? I do worry about it, so uh, I, I think uh, seeding that from childhood uh, is something that we should take a, uh, a conscious effort about. Uh, my personally, I grew up with a very modest uh, beginning. Uh, I was born here, I grew up in another country, and then I came back you know, as a teenager. So uh, having had a very modest life played a big role on me because I didn't have things, so it really exercised my mind to really wonder what are the rules of this world, right? What is making this world work? And I want, I have the desire to fill in the textbook and have more answers. So I resonate with that question and yes. I think we shouldn't forget the basics, so. Um, I, okay, I think, um, I think we should start in kindergarten um, with uh, um, lighting a spark about um, science and engineering and automation and robotics and, um, 
and a few years ago, we had um, some middle schoolers come and look at our robotics lab, and it was the middle school robotics class. So these are 10, 11, 12 year olds. There were 20 boys and no girls. And I, it actually kind of made me think, you know, why? And we talked to the teachers and stuff. So about four years ago, we started a program for middle school girls at Berkeley. It's called Girls in Engineering. And um, it's, um, they come for a week. So we have four weeks now. It's, it's growing. It's supported by um, the National Science Foundation and, um, and also um, some companies. And um, these girls spend, a, each group spends a week on campus, and they get to build little um, origami robots and, and put little buzzer um, motors on them and change their antennae so they track edges of, um, of, of books and things. And then they, they get to see our robots and they get to play with our robots. And um, I think that e this conversation starts early about inclusiveness, and, um, and it, it really has to start early. But, uh, point. Uh, the, uh, the previous comment mentioned AI and uh, possible discrimination. Uh, on the AI front, I guess people, I guess AI is a very broad term. What people really uh, mean is uh, machine learning, if you will. Uh, I guess there is one camp of the school of thought which says that use end-to-end -end machine learning all the way from uh, sensing all the way to actuation of an autonomous platform. And then basically, I guess there is another uh, school of thought which says that only use uh, machine learning for the front end, the sensing, and the recognition. So I guess uh, I, so, uh, you just need to be aware that there are two schools of thought. Uh, and meanwhile, with respect to discrimination, I strongly believe that uh, autonomous platforms need to basically have multiple sensor types, cameras, radars, ultrasonic, and uh, lidars. Uh, turns out that apart from uh, cameras, the other three basically are completely uh, agnostic to basically the, uh, the race and identity of the individuals. So basically when you fuse them together, it enhances uh, reliability and safety. At the same time, will not be discriminating against minorities of any kind. Very good. Very, very, very good question. Thank you. Sir? Uh, Jim Harris. Uh, I'm in Section 7 and uh, from Stanford University. And I, you know, all the discussion about autonomous vehicles seems to focus on an evolution to uh, having a, a partial driver and things. And um, from personal experience, uh, I just wonder if one might take a path where you go straight to autonomous vehicles, but uh, really restrict it. Uh, after my father passed away, my mother didn't drive, and so fortunately, I'd lived 800 miles away, and my best friend from high school used to take my mother to, she played bridge competitively until uh, she was 85. Uh, and my father-in-law uh, was not safe to drive, but he absolutely would not be removed from his car. Uh, and so just having a restricted, I mean, it, it just removes their mobility and ability to, you know, just go to the senior center, go to uh, where they have more social contact. And a couple of other friends I've seen where their a parent just became you know, housebound and really depressed. And, you know, if your parent is depressed, it really affects your life as well. So it, I just wonder if there's an alternative where you might be able to do that and just very restricted. And, you know, if the weather isn't good, there's fog or something, you, you can make it so your car wouldn't start. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and for people like that, if, if you can't go to do something that night, it's not a big deal. So it's an interesting concept. You, you, the whole idea of autonomy is, is, is a level of freedom, a level, level of, of, of uh, not having the controls that you normally have on life, and he's talking about a controlled version of it. That's interesting. Have, have you heard that? Uh, you sure. So there are two, two components to it. I guess with respect to driverless operations, we are truly between a rock and a hard place. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the primary core of the problem is that if the human is sitting there and you can actually throw back control to the, to the human, humans, we actually become uh, distracted, we are doing something else, and the vehicle says take control over. So, that's, so therefore, I guess uh, companies like Google have argued we should go, jump to level five, full automation, remove the driver from the equation completely. But the technology is not there yet. So that's basically, I guess, we are between a rock and a hard place, and practically I only see incremental automation uh, being uh, uh, put into place. That being said, uh, going back to the constrained environment, Today, there are startups which are basically trying to deploy autonomous vehicles for transporting uh, uh, elderly people 
in a gated closed community with just golf courses and so on. And because they are private roads, they don't have to really adhere to the public road regulations and so on. So some technologies are being demonstrated right now with exactly that uh, requirement in mind, but basically means that right now only people who can afford to live in those gated communities can get those technologies in the near future. But can't you have a remote pilot? Uh, so the remote pilot, uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, so basically, from a, if somebody needs to be uh, sitting in a remote seat and controlling things remotely, the question is basically whether you are responsible for the core real-time control, the uh, actuator control, or the supervisory control of specifying trajectories and such. Uh, I guess uh, that, of course, would be a very high-pressure job, just like air traffic controllers. <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, the labor cost will be high. You can imagine from an economic perspective, those jobs eventually migrating to a country like uh, uh, Thailand or Indonesia or Vietnam, right? We're kind of, uh, China is even uh, costly now. Uh, basically, then the question basically becomes the, the limits of physics come into play. At the speed of light, it's going to take several milliseconds or tens of milliseconds, and then you add the human delay on top of that. It's way too long uh, before you can stop the vehicle from uh, going into a ditch or uh, rolling over. So yes, it may play a role, but we need to be extremely cautious. If somebody can stump him with a question, <laughs> five bucks, <laughs> he's good. Oh, ask him the next medical one. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. We'll give him a medical question. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I'm Jim Jones from the University of Florida and also the National Science Foundation. And congratulations on a fantastic panel. Just really, really interesting. I wish more people were here to, to hear it. Uh, my question has to deal with land resources, so this would be for Raj and maybe Claire also. Uh, we're dealing in, Raj has talked out mostly with uh, transportation, uh, vehicles, uh, cars, trucks, and so forth on, on roads. But there's so much land mass out there in the U.S. and other countries that could benefit from the autonomous systems that you're talking about, and no one has really addressed that. And I'm thinking about environmental uh, management, environmental systems, engineering, and, and uh, agriculture, and forestry. And I know that there's some work being done in that, but I just wondered if, if you have any experience with that, and, and wonder uh, if you have any suggestions about how to kind of bleed your technology advances into uh, some of those fields as well. Some of the early adopters of autonomous uh, vehicles actually are in the domain of agriculture and in uh, mining and construction. I guess uh, yes. it turns out that farming is uh, by and large becoming a basically a large corporate activity where a single corporation owns really tens of thousands of acres and they can automate the whole process. It turns out that uh, because it's open skies in general, you can actually have good GPS and so on. You can program this machine to basically go uh, seed, harvest, uh, bundle together and so on. So it turns out that agriculture is actually a, literally a killer application in, in the good sense. Uh, the same applies to uh, mining and construction. Imagine a person operating a, a bulldozer day long, just sits there, interacts with nobody, basically uh, digs dirt, puts it on a dump truck, digs dirt, dirt right? Clearly, it turns out that uh, of the uh, list of desirable jobs, if you will, is like 247 out of 250, something like that, right? So finding people to basically hire, train, recruit, and retain is just a hard thing to do. So those are very logical uh, jobs to be automated, and companies like Caterpillar are spending mega bucks doing exactly that. It turns out that the cost of the sensors is relatively small compared to the size of the equipment, and therefore, cost is an even lower constraint. Yeah, very good. So um, DJI, which is like the Google of drone, of uh, quad rotors, is um, that you, you can buy a farming quad rotor now that will, um, look at, at the crops, it will, um, it will provide some um, watering and nutrients to the crops. There's also a, um, a ground air functionality, so you could have ground robots going down below the canopy of the crops, sending information to the quad rotor saying, this is where the soil is particularly dry, come over here and, um, and water them. So there's, I think there's great opportunities in agriculture that are already, you know, you can, you can buy a product. Um, I think that, you know, just also as a side of your question, using this additional land for some of these operations. The proposal that we have with NASA for an unmanned air system traffic management, a UTM, 
uses um, sparsely populated areas. You don't want quadrotors falling out of the sky on top of people. So you'd like to, if you're rooting them, you'd like to fly them over sparsely populated areas to get from, say, a heavily populated area to another heavily populated or, or to a sparsely populated area. So this rooting, automated rooting structure and immediate rerouting that uses this space is really important. I have to say, it's a great panel, but there's not a single question that hasn't advanced my knowledge of what we're discussing here. So I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thanks. Philip Krein, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Really appreciate Raj's comments earlier about the trolley problem, uh, because the, the question I always ask is, how did you get there? What mistakes were made on the way? So the, the question for the panel, I mean, uh, Expert systems are kind of passe as, a, as an AI technology, and we're doing deep learning and so forth. But in each one of your domains, it's possible to identify expert operators. You know, I, I, don't, I don't need my car to be perfect, but if it's driven by a world-class rally driver who, who has proven expertise across lots of domains, you know, I, I feel pretty comfortable. And I think the same thing applies to aircraft with top pilots and top controllers and, and certainly teleoperators in spacecraft and, and in marine. Do we have any progress? Do we have any ways to capture any of this and put it into our systems uh, and at least get that kind of a level? So hmm. Let me make uh, two observations. Observation one is that uh, the learning aspect to me actually is done offline. The data is collected online but the machine learning, the training actually happens offline. And then you basically incorporate the outcomes, if you will, the, the neural network. That's one. The, uh, the second is that uh, contrary to basically how we humans operate, uh, when you basically go through uh, a regimen of uh, training and then exposed to uh, a hazardous situation and so on, you learn how to figure it out. Unfortunately, that wisdom that you have learned uh, with hard effort is only confined to you and maybe to your immediate uh, uh, friends and relatives and such. But uh, conversely, if you are able to basically learn things with data on a vehicle that can basically be uh, fairly quickly migrated to pretty much all the vehicles around the planet, at least from that uh, car maker. So which basically means that uh, good things that you learn can be uh, disseminated fairly quickly. So can I, uh, so in the spacecraft world, um, we don't have that luxury of exercising a spacecraft you know, on Earth. So we tend to have to go the other way, where we start from a fundamental simulation, modeling and simulation, right? And then incremental tests or partial tests that you can put together with the simulation and the verification and validation test that answers the question of, you know, will this work, you know, in the nominal case? And then we have to go beyond the nominal case to what if? So this uh, fault detection and recovery in itself is something that we have to really look ahead, say this is how our system is designed, this is the environment that we expect. By the way, some of the, in some of the cases, our missions are going to places where we have never been you know, to before, and in fact, interacting with an environment that is, uh, we just know theoretically. And so really asking the questions ahead. So in our world, we don't get that luxury of kind of the machine learning or the um, deep learning. Yeah, it's about the si modeling simulation and the partial tests and then asking the what if and then covering all of those contingencies. Yeah, I, I would say there's, there's kind of three, maybe three levels that I wanna, I'll, I'll, fo I'll just sort of briefly mention in, in the marine space. So one is, is that, uh, you know, up to now, uh, you know, most of the operators of our autonomous systems, our AUVs, have been at sea on a ship and operating those vehicles, or maybe at an ice camp. Uh, and what that means is they're operating in an environment where they're maybe not 100%. As a matter of fact, they're almost surely not 100%. Uh, and so as a consequence, this whole hum human-machine interface for us is uh, sort of a pivotal part of, uh, of our of thinking of autonomy. So in effect, you know, autonomy begins with how the human operator uh, uh, tells the machine what they want it to do. And that's something which I think actually is not really getting uh, the attention it, it deserves, uh, uh, at least, uh, at least in, in our space. Uh, the second thing I'll, I'll say is that uh, for the machines to learn more about their environment, is fantastic, and I showed a little clip of a system that does that. 
Uh, one, of the, one of the problems we have, though, is that as you start operating multiple systems and they start learning about the environment, how do they communicate with each other? Because each of them is kind of creating their own vocabulary, if you will, to describe the environment as they go. And so James Kinsey and Yogi Girdar at our organization are beginning to think about how do you use the very low bandwidth links or high latency links in order to create sort of a common uh, operational picture, a common situational awareness among, among the platforms. And then the final place where I think that reliability and autonomy really comes to play is in the design space. So I, I think a lot about designing vehicles, um, but, you know, a little while ago, I had to, you know, think about an uh, addition to our house, and that software package, you know, it placed, uh, you know, it knew where all of the, uh, you know, the stringers should go, it knew how to wire the electrical system, it knew what code was. You know, in the design space, this is where you really want to fix problems. So when I have a vehicle at sea and it has a problem and we finally figure out what it was that we did wrong, I want to incorporate that back in the design space so that in effect the next vehicle I design, because of all of our stuff is pretty complex and it's short run, so the next vehicle incorporates those lessons. So I think the design environment is one of the environments where we in the autonomy space have to figure out uh, how to work. And by the way, that really includes code. So that's really, so automated code uh, generation hopefully uh, uh, will help a lot. Um, I think that maybe just to add one word, the airline operations centers are very advanced in terms of what they use for um, collecting data about all sorts of things, including pilots and who are the best pilots in terms of efficiency and um, why, and then using that in um, both their algorithm development for their own internal scheduling of how they want their, um, their individual flights to go, as well as how pilots should fly and how the aircraft, how the automation should fly certain routes. So, so there's a lot of advancement there because of the, because of the business and the, the bottom line. I think that in um, all of the domains that I talked about, there will be a significant use of, of learning and um, learning from data. And I think the key, I keep coming back to this, but the key will be safety. So being able to learn and maintain safety at the same time. And so have some, have some ways of bounding learning so that the constraints for safety are maintained. Uh, my name is David Goodyear um, from uh, Civil Section 4, uh, principally for Raj uh, about transportation policy. Um, uh, Professor Billy Hartz that I knew about uh, it, uh, from University of Washington about 25 years ago proposed a pod system uh, in lieu of more expensive uh, public transit rail systems and the like. Um, and I live out near Seattle where we spent, we just uh, approved a $50 billion bond issue for rail transit. Um, so my question is in terms of your timeline for uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, um, the, the same concepts of his pod system where he had dedicated right away, for instance, what we now have is HOV lanes, uh, would be pod lanes. What we now have is uh, second or third avenue, I don't remember which one it is in Seattle, where it's dedicated bus lanes. His concept was to dedicate, in the existing infrastructure, dedicate uh, lanes to his pod system, and you, you went, got in your pod, your private pod, you punched the, where you wanted to go, and off you went. Why are we not to that point, transportation policy notwithstanding, why are we not to that point with your level two autonomous vehicles that we could not um, imp greatly improve the mobility? It would seem that if you have autonomous vehicles, they can go with it say a 10 foot headway distance instead of 25 or, uh, or 75 or 85 feet uh, on dedicated right of way, you could uh, easily compete, in fact very favorably compete with these much more expensive you know, $50 billion rail system. You, it would seemingly, you could do this with dedicated right of way for a fraction of that cost. Sure, uh, so several thoughts. As you know, uh, the transportation landscape uh, in the US, I guess it's, uh, it's a mixture of uh, public and private enterprises, uh, as we probably, as we know, uh, the automotive industry, I guess, dating back to the 1950s and 1960s, uh, lobbied heavily, and the uh, railway infrastructure across the U.S. is relatively poor compared to what we have in Europe or Asia, for example. Uh, so setting aside uh, those dynamics, there are uh, uh, city-states like uh, Dubai and uh, Abu Dhabi, where they're looking to basically uh, 
uh, incorporate uh, personalized uh, pods that likely take you from point A to point B. You get in, basically punch the destination, it takes you there, and these are on dedicated structures. Therefore, from a technical standpoint, very feasible. It's only a cost of economics, and those states can afford it. Uh, basically, mapping it to the U.S. context, if you look at the economic uh, environment, uh, exactly what uh, Uber and Lyft are trying to do is basically is that, hey, uh, take the human driver out of the equation, let the cars drive themselves, and those are the incentives. Uh, so uh, the uh, re replacing public transit is a huge and complex topic uh, on, on its own. Uh, the problem that I guess the, uh, those companies are facing is uh, the technology is not there. Right? They would love to basically have the technology in place yesterday, but it's not going to be happening. So the public-private discussion is a lot deeper topic we should take offline. But what technology is not I there got, I got yet? I got to right keep moving on. Okay. I've got a few more right. minutes left, but thank you. Sir. Yes, I'm Mark Adamiak <clears throat> with General Electric. Uh, first, one quick comment on education. I have a two-year-old grandson. Whenever he comes over, it's into the basement, and we start building blocks and Legos. So it starts starting early there. Uh, Follow-up question as far as early autonomous vehicles. Voyager is question, two questions. Is JPL still talking to Voyager? And if they are, how long does it take for the message to get around? So the answer, yes, JPL is still communicating. The Voyager, the second Voyager has left the solar system, so it's left the heliosphere. The communication, I have to get back to you. It's a long, I, I, I don't know the answer. It's, Long time, yeah. yeah. 35 <laughs> hours? Is it, somebody said 30, yeah, so I can confirm the hour. Right. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. Yes. A, a great, uh, a great uh, a documentary just out now on, on the, it was a spacecraft, by the way, called The Farthest. It was on PBS, definitely worth watching. Good. Sir. Back, uh, John, sorry, John Cassani is somewhere, right? Is John here? Or? There's John. John, you have to give, John actually developed, was on Voyager development, so. Um, hey, wow, <laughs> yes. granddaddy. <laughs> <laughs> it's still out there after 35 years, so, yeah. Jyoti Mazumdar, University of Michigan, Section 10. My question is more bolts and not, not philosophical. Raj very elegantly described all the possibilities when the accident may come. I play with automating the 3D printing business. And what I found, you can diagnose the problem, the computer model to diagnose is probably millisecond at best. When you want to control it, especially in human situation, you might have to get the answer in microseconds and you're solving 15 to 20 differential equation. Is the algorithm exist or the computer exist? I guess from a timing perspective, uh, let me give you some extreme numbers. Uh, 90 miles per hour, right? So, so very few people uh, basically go about 90 miles per hour, right? Even somebody like me. Uh, uh, <laughs> so that 90 miles, I guess we basically translate that to uh, meters per second, it's 40 meters per second. So in one second, your car travels 40 meters, quite some distance it turns out, right? So basically, it's, uh, so we are basically reacting at 40 meters per second, if you will. And then if you basically translate it to uh, one millisecond, we're talking about four centimeters. So basically, so it turns out that even though actually it is a very challenging problem, you need to be making decisions at highway speeds of up to 40 meters per second. In why, if I guess if you basically are off by a couple of milliseconds, you're off by eight centimeters. So we're well within the margin of error, it turns out. And it turns out that we humans, we basically get distracted by about a half a second, a second all the time. And uh, we still have only have about 36,000 deaths. So yes, it is a challenging problem, but well within the scope of what we can do. Very good, thank you. Uh, Kevin Boke at Boeing. Uh, thank you for all your contributions to the panel. Very interesting. Uh, my question is for Professor Tomlin. Um, recently, I, well, you mentioned that uh, you thought it'd be a long time but there were, before there would be humans not in the control loop for flying machines. But I read that recently in Dubai they did a demonstration of an automated flying taxi, not with a human in it, but they have a goal to do that by 2020, fully operational, and Uber is trying to actually beat them to that. Um, is that realistic? If so, why? And if not, why? And why does that not kind of jibe with your view of, of human control? When I think of Dubai, I think of it as this amazing city where there's all sorts of experiments going on for pushing the, pushing the limits of autonomy. It's not only in the air, but also their, their traffic, the autonomous traffic routing system that they have. I think that... Um, in terms of an air taxi in the, the US, 
I think that it is, it is possible. I think though that there will be a pilot either on board or, or there will have to be a pilot either on board or a remote pilot that's in charge of that vehicle. Um, just because of the, um, the airspace and the conservativeness that we are, I think rightly so, putting on the um, airspace operations for these vehicles. So um, I think operating in, I would say operating in Dubai and operating in the US, um, the big difference is um, the, the airspace, the, the way that the airspace is regulated and the, um, and the, the, need to, um, the, the need to prove safety of that operation. Thank you. My name is Prachi Wakaria and I'm the global chairperson for the Society for Automotive Engineers, SAE, they make regulations for autonomous vehicles. And I'm the chairperson for a committee on shared and digital mobility. And our committee looks at various things like accessibility, telematics, different models, uh, V2V technologies. And one of the important questions for this committee is going to be this, is uh, Mobile, uh, Mobile Eye and Intel claim that uh, every day an autonomous vehicle generates about 4,000 GB of data. So the collection, storage, as well as the complex computational al analysis of all of this data is going to be energy inefficient. So what are the ways in which we can make uh, AV cars, but also all the other vehicle systems, so, so for James, Claire, and Mimi, for all of you as well, what are the ways in which we can add energy efficiency as well as computational efficiency into our autonomous systems? I imagine even in your world, this is a big issue, right? You've got... Uh, just a lot of information being generated all the time. Yes, so uh, I'm trying to, so you're talking about the uh, data management, right. is it? So right. So Intel and Mobileye claim that they're generating 4,000 GB of data every single day, each vehicle. Right. So and this is, you know, to, to analyze that is going to take a lot of energy. Yes. How do you add efficiency to this? Right, so um, the, on spacecraft, uh, th there is a traditional uh, conflict <laughs> between um, how much you want to analyze on board. And so I think you, there's a difference between data and there's information, right? So I think uh, scientists uh, tend to want every single bit of data collected you know, from a planetary target. Uh, they've been waiting to get to it, and they don't trust some pre-processing algorithm <laughs> to say, here is your information. So that's a continual uh, 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 you know, conflict, so to speak. So two ways that we overcome on the spacecraft side. One is, of course, the advances in the computers. Again, I want to emphasize to the engineering community, I think uh, more reliable, higher capability computers with much increased uh, memory on board. Uh, second is to uh, increase uh, the onboard processing capability, again, to try to uh, reduce that amount of data that comes down. Uh, third is the bandwidth uh, that we have between the spacecraft and the Earth. So we've gone from you know, S-band communication in the olden days to X-band to K-band, and we're trying to, we are demonstrating optical communications. So uh, uh, making the bandwidth larger uh, would be the other uh, capability on top of uh, onboard um, computation. And again, I think even in the onboard computation, that involves uh, advanced algorithms you know, for data reduction, but as well as the faster computational platforms that can get the answers. So in the, in the automotive context, uh, you pointed out three dimensions. That's the data requirement, the, story, the storage requirement, the computational requirement, and the communication requirement. In terms of uh, data, I guess uh, storage media are getting cheaper and cheaper. In principle, you could uh, st store a lot, but the question is if it's 4,000 gigabytes a day, you know, how much can you store? And with respect to the uh, computational, I guess the end users are not going to have the computational power. And from a communication standpoint, you cannot communicate with all the, all the data being collected in uh, real time, right? So those are challenges. So the solutions are similarly along a spectrum. You can basically have uh, uh, quote unquote, your own in vehicle cloud, if you will, in the trunk, basically, which uh, stores a lot of data. You can actually have cloudlets, basically, in and around traffic lights, which basically get the data, process, and so on. I can imagine local processes being done and only the digest being sent all the way to the cloud. You basically have an in vehicle cloud, uh, uh, an edge cloudlet, uh, uh, right? And then basically all the way to, to the cloud. And then, meanwhile, I do expect that these vehicles over, over time will have the same requirement that aviation has having a black box that records at least the past half an hour and overrides data on top of that in case there is a crash of some kind and things need to be investigated. Let, let me just say, add, add one more thing to that. I think in the, the UAV space where this question is, is coming up, 
it, it's actually these, these limitations that are helping us define what should be done in the air and what should be done on the ground. So just, um, you know, th there's a lot of pre-design pre and pre-programming and, and sort of the use of um, data ahead of time in batch that can go into that design. But um, tactical collision avoidance is, has to be done in the air, and that means real-time sensor data in the air. And so really thinking about, you know, how we design, it, it's interesting that that's how, what it comes down to, but it's, it's very important in separating the air-ground functionality. I think that um, this is, um, as, as we as a community, in, in data science and AI and control get better, and we get better at real-time data analytics, It'll, it'll, things can change, but right now that's really the, the equation. So, oh, good, sorry. Yeah, so I, I would just say that in, in our case, our product is data. So, so our vehicles, uh, it, the data they produce is in effect the reason they, they exist. We get some of the data back in real time, uh, and that's very important to us because we get to choose where they go next, but also a lot of times we're feeding it into models. And in fact, those models for us frequently become the, uh, you know, the real source of data, particularly if uh, you run ensembles, which is what you would really, really like to do. Uh, you often, from the platforms, or almost always from the platforms, you don't get all of the data on the platform back until you get, until you get the platform back. Uh, but but uh, yeah, so so I, this is a it's a it's a great question, and there's it's a very deep one. I mean, you could probably have several of these things just on the data side alone. I had time for one last question. Thank you. Yes, one okay, question. Julia Phillips, Home Secretary of NAE. One of our sections is Earth Resources, and um, of course we have an expert on the panel around the autonomous systems in the ocean. Um, there was a a question earlier that talked a little bit about mining, but the answer quickly moved into agriculture and the like. I'm curious about the um, similarities and differences you might expect between operating in the ocean and operating in the subsurface of the earth, the rest of the earth. Um, so, um so I think that the ocean environment, uh, in some respects, is a, a little bit of a simpler environment to operate for us and that our platforms don't go that fast. Uh, water is a thousand times denser than atmosphere. Uh, that kind of drives the energy economics, if you will, of motion. Uh, so as a consequence, we can close our control loops uh, you know, slowly. We have enormous sensing problems in the underwater environment. Cameras don't see very far. Uh, and the sonar systems that we depend on are pretty expensive and, and, power, and power hungry. So we, have a, we do have challenges uh, uh, sensing in the underwater environment. And of course, navigation for us, we have no silver bullet. Um, you know, GPS, and yes, it's denied in places, you know, feels very much like a silver bullet to me that you have to deal with the edge cases. In the underwater environment, we, you know, we have to consistently come up with specialized navigation solutions, particularly for, uh, and a lot of those, by the way, involve surfacing and talking to GPS or having something at the surface which does have GPS that communicates to something below. So, you know, very often for us, it comes back to GPS, except, for example, when you're under ice. So, uh, you know, under ice is, is a particularly cha challenging environment, and you can think about trying to do long runs under grounded ice to the grounding line, very exciting class of missions, uh, where you pretty much have to develop uh, a navigation system from scratch. So I, I think, I, I don't, I, I'm not totally sure I, I got your question. Hopefully that helped you understand some of the areas where I think we're, we're different from, you know, where you have challenges compared to some of the other environments. All right, I'm out of time, but this gentleman's been standing there, so I'll make it real quick and I can get one more sure. in. Sure. Um, at the beginning, uh, Alan Wilner, Section 7, University of Southern California. If, at the beginning of personal computers, we were talking about doing our checkbooks. In the beginning of the internet, we were talking about email. A lot of what's been talked about has been replacing the human. What things may be in the future that are completely different than what we think today that go far beyond just replacing the human? A great question to end it off on. I like that. Okay, guys, you got autonomous vehicles, then what? Sure, a couple of things will happen. For example, uh, we currently, our cars are really uh, steel cages, if you will, to protect uh, you and your uh, co-passengers from, uh, from a crash, right? So vehicles basically can drive themselves, are known to be extremely safe. Crashes are a thing of the past. That steel can go away. 
can basically become very light and therefore uh, they go much farther, so it will be friendly to the environment. The other thing that can happen is that the vehicle is driving itself, the driver has no function, if you will, does not exist, and therefore the interior of the car it basically can be configured, if you will, uh, on the fly as a, as a living room, as a dining place, as an office, as a bedroom, and so on, right? So, uh, and then meanwhile, the insurance costs drop, the insurance industry kind of goes away, the body shop industry kind of peters away. Uh, and, and in the future, uh, nobody has a driver's license, nobody knows how to drive. Uh, the, the future looks very interesting. <laughs> I think in the ocean environment, uh, you know, what you're going to see is you're going to see increasingly specialized robotic systems that are interdependent and support each other. And that's in contrast today, we tend to think of, you know, we got to produce our vehicle in such a way, and it has to operate in such a way that it can take care of itself, it can work independently out there. Uh, as you get to these more interdependent platforms in the ocean, uh, carrying out various, uh, you know, important tasks, uh, you know, for science, but also for industry, for defense, you know, I think you get something that looks a little bit like a robot civilization, you know, where you have a set of, uh, you know, economics, if you will, uh, you know, revolving around energy and information and so on, which have to be managed, uh, uh, managed by these platforms. So I, I, think, I think that's where we're going in the ocean environment. Um, I'd like a, an air traffic control system where I could just go to the go to Dulles and say I need to be in San Francisco by 5 p.m. and it's worth this much to me and they sell me a ticket on whatever airline is going to guarantee that and maybe I can have plus or minus half an hour and then I pay a little bit um, a little bit less. I'd like a um, air traffic control system that really is um, you know human centric so it it it, it um, allows the the kind of economics and, and maybe incentivization that we as, as humans are used to and allows us to put in our preferences and get a service that, um, that we're happy with and that, it, that is adaptable, that allows for these different modes of transportation but allows them safe um, in, in a safe way and a very efficient way. And in space, uh, definitely, <coughs> I, I don't believe it's about replacing human, what humans do. Uh, I, I see space as expanding human capability out there. So moving from near the Earth, you know, moving humans living in the orbit or doing things on the moon that we can't do on Earth. Uh, autonomy is needed for humans to extend our existence beyond the planet Earth. And then in terms of the deep space exploration, autonomy is needed. We have barely scratched the surface of what we do in other planets, right? We have you know, gone, we have landed on a, a few other planets, but there are fleets of uh, satellites, there are formation flying, multiple spacecraft missions we can do. There are samples that we want to bring back physically, even from Mars. We, have, we would love to bring back samples from Mars. We haven't done that yet. Those are the things we want to do. We want to explore ocean worlds. And then we haven't even talked about interstellar space. We haven't gone there. And then how do we really study you know, other constellations away from us? And ultimately, can we get there? Is there some way to get there? Or how do we investigate? So to me, those are autonomy, advancement in autonomy, and reliability of you know, advanced technologies are needed for us human beings to reach out there. Okay, so uh, I'm glad I took that question. Uh, I, uh, I'm giving up my time to summarize this because the only reason they invite me here is to keep this thing on time, and I have badly not done that today. Uh, but that's because your questions were so terrific and your answers were so terrific. So I want to call on Dan Mote right now, but I want to thank my uh, panelists, Mimi, Claire, James, and Raj, for just a mind-blowing conversation. Thank you. That's absolutely great panel. Th thank you very much. Oh, wonderful. I tell you, this is all going to be written up. You're going to get a, a booklet. We'll have this a panel get, uh, back and forth. All the material on this will be distributed. It takes about 10 months to get this done, but you'll, you'll be able to recap all of this and you'll have a permanent record of this. So I want to thank the panel very much for making this such a, a wonderful uh, event for, for this uh, this the academy. Uh, we'll, th this will be long, long remembered, and we have your predictions for the future, so we can check to see how you're doing uh, <laughs> and, and later on as well. Uh, so thank you all very much. Uh, the, we have a, we have lunch 